Greetings and welcome to the University of Minnesota Alumni Association's webinar series. My name is John Ruzek and I'm the Senior Director of Alumni Networks for the Alumni Association. Thanks to uh, all the alumni and friends uh, who have joined us today uh, and taken time out of your day to join us live. Uh, we're gonna be talking about election 2016. Um, uh, but before then, we just have a couple quick announcements to do. Uh, today's webinar is part of an ongoing free series being offered by the Alumni Association, where we're having conversations with experts about career, life, and learning topics. Uh, we've had over 4,600 uh, folks join us live over the last couple years with these webinars. And so we really wanna thank you for your participation and initiatives like these are made part in pos or made possible in part by our Alumni Association members. So thank you so much. And if you're interested in becoming a member of the Alumni Association, you can go to umnalumni.org slash membership. Uh, just a couple other things coming up. Uh, upcoming webinars on November 3rd, we have a stress management one. And then on November 17th, uh, we'll have a career coach from the Carlson School of Management talking about uh, building that perfect resume and you can find those at umnalumni.org slash virtual and on November 2nd next week we have a virtual uh, networking event for alumni uh, so whether near or far you can join us online for some speed networking and that's at the same uh, virtual uh, URL as well. Uh, before we get started here's just a couple of housekeep ide housekeeping items with GoToWebinar. Uh, you have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you'd prefer to listen over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane of your GoToWebinar panel and dial-in information will be displayed. If you experience audio difficulties while listening via your computer speakers, this can be caused by having multiple software applications open or perhaps uh, listening in on a wireless signal. Uh, so feel free to close any unnecessary apps or move to a hardwired uh, connection. Uh, questions will be welcome uh, during this webinar. Uh, I believe we'll take them towards the end of the webinar after both presenters have uh, concluded their presentations. Uh, but if you have anything, uh, uh, just uh, type that in the questions pane on your GoToWebinar panel. And uh, we hope this is an engaging uh, conversation uh, for you today. So with election day 2016 less than two weeks away, what are the big issues driving the presidential race? Who will prevail in the critical battleground states and win on election day? And what is the current state of play with the nation's election system? Will voters be confronted with long lines and election officials scrambling to deal with court challenges? Well, today we will hear from two experts from the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs as they provide an insider's view and an outlook uh, of the 2016 vote. Uh, Larry Jacobs is the Walter F. and Joan Mondale Chair for Political Studies and Director of the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the Humphrey School. Dr. Jacobs has published 15 books and edited volumes and dozens of articles on elections, legislative and presidential politics, elections and public opinion, and a range of public policies, and regularly provides political analysis for local and national media. Doug Chapin is the director of the university's Certificate in Election Administration Program. Uh, Doug came to the Humphrey School after 10 years at the Pew Charitable Trust, where he served as director of elections initiatives for the Pew Center on the states. Prior to being at Pew, uh, Chapin was an attorney in the private practice specializing in election and ethics law. He served as elections counsel to the Democrats on the U.S. Senate Rules Committee from 1997 to 2000, where he focused on federal election legislation. So um, we'll give a big warm welcome to both Larry and Doug. Thank you for being here today. It's uh, good to be here. Um, I'm just so pleased to uh, be doing this with my colleague, Doug Chapin, in the entire country. Doug Chapin is the person I go to most often uh, to really figure out what's going on in terms of the administration of elections, and obviously this year we we're having a lot of discussion about whether the elections will be rigged, there's concerns about uh, voter ID and the effects that might have, and all those issues uh, Doug's going to take on. Um, I'm going to uh, go out first and talk about the kind of the politics of where we are and, and um, what, what we're seeing so far. Um, and doing that, I want to push us in a direction that uh, is not common in today's uh, environment. Usually with the press, we talk about uh, the personalities and obviously there's plenty to talk about with Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Uh, but I want us to focus on what I consider to be the structural issues 
the factors that I think are really driving this uh, election and help to account for some of the puzzles. So let me start out with um, the, ki the kind of situation I'm often finding when I'm out talking to Minnesotans and other folks around the country and to my students when the election comes up. This is often what I'm faced with uh, because there's a lot of confusion as to what's actually going on in this election season. And I want to start off first by um, talking about why Donald Trump won the nomination and why I think this is going to be a closer uh, um, uh, national election uh, than a lot of the pundits are currently predicting, uh, with many suggesting that Hillary Clinton will win overwhelmingly. I do not expect that to happen. Um, and so let me uh, dig in on a few reasons for Donald Trump's rise and why he continues to have, I think, a quite potent campaign with, with many Americans. One is the spirit, the environment we're in uh, at, at this moment is a revolt, a populist revolt of the sort we have not seen for, we have not seen in years. Um, and luckily, we've got some data to back this up. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the things I love about uh, public opinion research is when we have the same identically worded question asked decade over decade, and we've got that in two very helpful uh, series. One uh, uh, weighs the trust in government, simply asks whether uh, you have, uh, uh, whether you trust the government all the time or some of the time and so forth. And we're not a, now at an all time low. Just 19% of Americans say they trust the government and it's actually considerably lower among politically active Republicans, only 6%. And so when you hear the kind of rhetoric we've heard from Donald Trump um, about the government being stupid and so forth, he's clearly channeling that deep distrust in government, again, at a record low. We've also heard both from Donald Trump and from Bernie Sanders, the sense that the political system is rigged. Um, Bernie Sanders talked about kind of Wall Street uh, running government um, and so forth. And that is also uh, channeling a powerful uh, trend in American politics. Again, for decades, we've been asking whether uh, Americans see the, the government as being run for the benefit of, the all, of, of all of us or being run for the benefit of a few big interests. And that sense of government being run for the benefit of all of us is at or near an all-time low and helps to explain that sense of rigging and why that's been so popular this year. Now, a second factor is partisanship. In which party you identify with. And there was probably a period uh, back three, four decades ago in which you'd have a large number of people saying they didn't really uh, belong to either party. Um, or you would find, as in the case of uh, the 1950s when uh, Dwight Eisenhower was winning the presidency, lots of Democrats uh, crossing over and voting for him. Those days are over. And what we've been seeing for the last decade or so is 90 percent or more of Democrats and Republicans voting for their party standard bearer. Um, and this helps to explain why Donald Trump's support has remained so constant. And there have been a lot of predictions after uh, some of the controversies around him that his support would collapse. That's not actually happening. Um, the, as I'm going to show you a little bit later, his support's actually been pretty stable. Um, and the impact on uh, the congressional races and, and other races have not been as devastating as the pundits have been predicting. Um, so far, Donald Trump has not hit 90 percent of Republicans in the polls. But I think as we get closer to election day and on election day, we'll be real close to this, this kind of standard of uh, Republicans rallying around uh, Donald Trump, even th though they have real qualms about him. It's, it, you know, you can think of party identification not as a cognitive process, but more as a psychological identification. It defines who you are as a person. Now, another factor, uh, and this again is, um, pretty uh, generic. We see this year in, year out, which is that um, presidential elections in particular are often referendums on the in-party. Ronald Reagan captured this, I think, best in 1980 
when he when he looked into the camera and said, "Are you better now than you were four years ago?" Um, if you are, then you should reward the incumbent. Uh, if you're not, then you should punish the incumbent by voting for me. And this this uh, slide simply shows you uh, the way that's working. It's uh, it uses a simple um, uh, question, which is simply whether you think the country's heading in the right direction or off on the wrong track. You can see in 2004, less than half of Americans thought we were off on the wrong track, and George Bush won pretty convincingly re-election. Uh, shoot ahead four years, and the Iraq war has not gone well. We've had a tremendous financial crisis, and three quarters of the country uh, said that we were off on the wrong track. And then if you just move a little bit there further to the right, you'll see that Barack Obama won 62% of those who said we we're off on the wrong track. So those who are unhappy with the direction the country's going in will often cast the ballot for the out party. And it's not really based on policy. It's not based on personality. It's just based on this idea of we need change. Things aren't going well. Um, today, we're close to two thirds of Americans saying that we're heading off on the wrong track. Um, and those people, a good number, you know, that two thirds, they're gonna, a good number of them are gonna cast the ballot for, for uh, Mr. Trump even though they may not appreciate his actual policies, even though they might be offended by some of his policies. Now, let me um, uh, uh, turn the tables now and look at Hillary Clinton, who is ahead in, in, um, uh, in national polls and in many state polls. Uh, why is she uh, persevering despite uh, Donald Trump's campaign and despite her own um, mishaps? Well, one factor is that uh, Hillary Clinton has built an incredible organization. Um, you know, whether you look at staff, um, Clinton probably has about a four to one advantage over Trump. The number of election offices, this is very important because it's going to allow Hillary Clinton to uh, have the kind of uh, person to person relationships uh, with voters, millions of voters through the volunteers and the paid staff and the campaign offices uh, to be able to tailor their messages, the micro target, um, uh, their arguments uh, to particular voters who have particular concerns. Um, this is a process that was introduced by Karl Rove and George Bush most effectively in 2004. And um, you saw Barack Obama improve it in 2008 and 12. Uh, Hillary Clinton has picked that up. Donald Trump, and it's a mystery to all of us, has refused to uh, invest in an organization. Um, and you know we could disagree on, uh, we're not even sure what the impact of this will be, but it'll probably be one to 3% of a greater turnout uh, for Clinton than Trump than you would expect without organization. Now, it's important to add um, that Hillary Clinton needs this advantage in terms of organization. This slide is based on um, an experiment that the New York Times ran in, in Florida. Um, and what they found is that among voters who were most likely to turn out, Donald Trump had a seven point lead. Now these would be voters who tend to be older, they tend to be white, they tend to be better educated. Hillary Clinton's advantage is among um, voters who are less well educated, who tend to be non-white, tend to be younger their turnout profile is very different from the older voter. Um, and Hillary Clinton, therefore, needs this organizational advantage to literally get her voters to the voting booth and uh, casting a ballot. Now, one of the questions that often comes up is, well, you know, Hillary Clinton um, has this tremendous advantage among women. That's true. And actually, if you can start on the left side of the slide, you can see she's doing very well and better than uh, Barack Obama did in 2012 among some important groups of voters. Among college degree voters, we're seeing uh, Hillary Clinton building a substantial advantage. Um, it shows you that her advantage over Donald Trump is it's about 30 points, 30 percentage points. Um, and by the way, this is a reversal from what had historically been the case where Republicans had done better among the better educated. Women, again, uh, this has been one of the big stories. Um, Hillary Clinton, among some polls, doing better among African-Americans than Barack Obama did in 
2012 and holding her own or maybe a bit better among Latinos. But here's the key point I want to make here. Donald Trump also has uh, these uh, gaps in his favor. It's not just that Hillary Clinton has got um, advantages. Donald Trump does as well. Um, in a what, what could become a major reversal of our patterns, uh, Donald Trump has eaten into the, um, the support that the Democrats have generally gotten from the less affluent, in this case, uh, less than 50,000. Um, uh, he's also uh, now uh, built quite an advantage among the uh, voters who do not have college degrees um, and men and among whites. Um, now, these are substantial gaps and have enormous implications because uh, uh, whites are the largest proportion of, uh, of voters who will be casting ballots. So, yes, Hillary Clinton has got advantages among women and other groups, but it's very important to appreciate that Donald Trump is uh, benefiting from tremendous advantages as well among certain uh, groups of voters. Um, there's also clearly a, a geographic uh, built-in advantage for Democrats. If you go back to 1992, you'll see that Democrats have year in, year out, been getting about 242 electoral college votes out of the 270 you need in order to win the election. Um, and you can see these areas of you know, really locked in support the Northeast, it's now a lock for the Democrats. Um, in the West, um, big advantages, California, Oregon, Washington, these are now locks. Democrats have been doing much better in the Southwest, uh, Nevada, um, New Mexico, um, and perhaps even Arizona this year. In the Midwest, there's been a battle, but um, you know we do see consistent Democratic wins there. Um, even in the South, uh, we've seen some erosion of the Republican support. We may see some more of uh, this year. Now, um, that's a tremendous advantage that um, Democrats have. And Hillary Clinton has now been building on that this year. This is from Real Clear Politics. And uh, this number is probably, it could be higher than what we're going to see. This is based on polling just done in which even close races um, that are only you know a few points apart have been assigned to each candidate. So we can just take a kind of a snapshot. And this shows you exactly what I'm talking about. You can see in the Northeast, um, uh, Hillary Clinton is doing very well. Um, even moving into the South with Virginia and North Carolina, Georgia, by the way, uh, surprisingly close, usually lock solid for, um, uh, for Republicans. Florida, very close. Uh, you know, I'd say at this point, you know, more in the toss up, but if we had to push it today, it looks like it, uh, there's a little bit of an advantage there for Hillary Clinton. You can see Colorado and New Mexico. Um, also, um, uh, Hillary Clinton is surprisingly close in Texas. I don't think she's going to win there, but it's you know six, seven point difference. Um, and then the north, and then the um, the west, uh, very solid. Uh, and this is a pretty classic pattern. Um, I don't think this is going to change much. Uh, to be honest with you, I, it's not to say that there's no chance Donald Trump's going to win, but you know I think it's possible here in Minnesota that by seven o'clock it will be obvious that Donald Trump has lost, uh, particularly if Florida and North Carolina uh, head into the Clinton camp and are declared um, in the Northeast, which is what we'll know first on Election Day. Once you see that happen, then it's all over for Donald Trump. He literally has no path to winning. If he's able to win both of those. He's still in the ball game, but uh, at this point, we're not seeing evidence of that. Um, let me just quickly uh, mention uh, some uncertainties. Uh, I'm hearing a lot about that, and then uh, quickly touch on uh, some of the congressional races, and then I'll, I'll uh, turn things over to my colleague, Doug Chapin. Uh, there are certainly some uncertainties here. We may get some more surprises um, uh, this month, the closing uh, days. I think the fact that uh, the skyrocket uh, premiums uh, for um, the Affordable Care Act that's catching news. And here in Minnesota, uh, it's getting quite a bit of headline news. And that story can actually pick up more speed because of the enrollment period that's going to begin on November 1st. And I think the number of the plans are going to close very quickly. And the press is bound to, to kind of latch onto that. Another thing to keep in mind is 
a lot of the polling going on right now is finding about 15% of people saying they're even either haven't made up their mind or they're going to cast a, a ballot for one of the third parties. We usually see the third party support uh, decline as you get closer to election day, um, and those undecided people will make up their mind. So that's that's much more um, kind of flexibility and and slack uh, in the election than we we have been seeing. Um, and obviously, if that breaks decidedly towards Mr. Trump, it's going to create a lot of opportunities for him. Um, finally, what is election day? Uh, we're seeing a record levels of absentee uh, ballots here in Minnesota now that you don't need to provide an excuse. And all over the country, estimate is maybe 40% of eligible voters will be casting their ballot uh, before November 8th. Um, and that's, I think, uh, a major change and one that we're really wrestling with. Okay, let me say a word about uh, very quickly about Congress, a uh, very close battle for the U.S. Senate. I don't think it's possible really to make much of a prediction here other than to say that I've been impressed. If you look in the Northeast, you'll see New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. And I follow these races very closely, um, and I am not seeing much of an effect of Donald Trump. Now, if you look at that spike, um, that, that, that is, uh, that's New Hampshire, um, and that was right around the Democratic Convention. And when you had this kind of uh, pretty po uh, effective Democratic convention, it hurt the Republicans and helped the Democrats. So this is looking at the advantage for the Democrats ab above the line and the advantage for Republicans below the line. But here's the point I want to get to. After that, that kind of bump from the convention, as you move out, there hasn't been much of an effect of Donald Trump. When his the sex tape came out, when he's had some really poor debate performances, it's not had a kind of profound effect on what are very, very close races. I think these races probably would be in about this state if you had a Republican nominee named Rubio or Bush. Um, and it suggests to me that Donald Trump's impact down ballot may not be as dramatic as some of the pundits are suggesting at this point. Um, the House representatives, I see really no chance that the Democrats are going to get uh, the majority back. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, part of it is gerrymandering, but I would caution you from, from um, exaggerating that. Maybe it accounts for eight of those 57 uh, seats, uh, maybe a bit more, but it doesn't account for really the lion's share of the uh, Republican advantage. Uh, part of the story is we've seen a dramatic drop off in the number of congressional races that are truly competitive you know, within five points. Uh, it's about half as many competitive races since the uh, late 1990s. There's also a pattern where we're seeing um, partisan uh, voting as, as a kind of a block. And so we have more districts where Republicans have a bit of an advantage over the Democrats in terms of the number of voters who identify as Republicans. And those voters are voting uh, as a block for their party, and that's helped out the Republicans quite a bit. The other part is, and you can see this in the map, the Republican vote is nicely distributed around the country. And then within states, it's distributed pretty well outside of the urban areas. The Democrats tend to have the concentration of their voters in the urban areas, and so they win much more, for instance, uh, by 65 or even 75 percent of the vote than the Republicans. Republicans are more efficient in that they win with, you know, 55 or a bit more than 60 percent. And that helps to explain this majority. The point being very difficult uh, for the Democrats to take that uh, majority away in the, uh, from the Republicans in the short term. Uh, just a quick uh, word about the Minnesota races. I think these are going to be very close races. Um, there's just six or seven uh, net seats separating the um, uh, Democratic or um, Republican majorities in the Minnesota House and the Senate. Um, the effects of presidential election, I think, will be significant. But on the other hand, the arrival of uh, health reform as a top of the agenda issue may also have an effect that's favorable for Republicans. And there are parts of the state where Donald Trump is doing very well. He has double-digit leads 
according to the polls, in uh, northern Minnesota and western Minnesota, um, um, and that may af affect uh, some key some key races. Um, let me stop there and turn things over to uh, my uh, colleague Doug Chapin, and just say by way of introduction, Doug is a election geek, and all the kind of talking about partisanship and uh, the politics of elections, that's not what Doug's about. Doug is going to be about telling you the law and the rules um, with no spin. Great. Well, thank you, Larry. It's always uh, um, it's always nice to be um, with Larry, partly because I do tell people that I'm an election geek, not a political junkie. And it's always nice to have um, the king of the junkies next to you when it's time to talk about um, the, the 2016 um, election. Um, so let me start um, with um, a couple of slides here. I'm going to work my way through. Um, Larry obviously had way more content than uh, he had time for. So um, as we wait for my slide to pop up, let me start by talking about turnout um, this year. It is a, um, a fact um, in American politics that um, turnout tends to spike in presidential election years, but then is down significantly in uh, other uh, election years. Um, and that trend over time um, has held up as voters tend to come out uh, on um, presidential election days, um, but then don't show up for midterm or other state elections. Um, some of that is because people are obviously more plugged into national issues, partly because um, they're willing to let their neighbors and friends um, do the heavy lifting in um, other elections. But from the perspective of an election geek and someone who cares about election officials across the country, um, if you look at that gap between presidential election years and midterm elections, what that means is that in a presidential election year, you end up with huge numbers of voters who are otherwise um, not regular voters. And in fact, I have a friend in the business who refers to them as cicada voters, um, folks who um, vote in presidential elections and then promptly disappear for four years uh, and then return. Um, the impact we see is that that means lots more bodies at the polls on and before election day. But the, the impact we don't see, which I think is just as important to remember, is that because these folks have been away from um, elections for four years, um, they don't realize um, how much elections have changed. And um, you should always be leery of somebody um, quoting themselves, but this is something I wrote um, a little while ago in talking about um, cicada voters. Um, while there's a cohort of habitual voters who usually tend to skew older, who vote frequently enough that there are few surprises, a significant remainder of the electorate is made up of otherwise smart, capable people who haven't memorized or kept up with changes in the election process while they were busy living their lives. Um, I think in election years, we often forget that we, we tend to think about voters in groups, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the soccer moms or, or what have you. But we remember that, that voters are people with lives. They have bills to pay. They have kids to raise. They have businesses to run. Um, and um, unlike geeks like me, uh, they are not paying attention to the nitty gritty of the American election process. Uh, and this year, that's going to be significant because you can make the argument that the American election process has changed more in the last four years than in just about any four years in our nation's history. And I want to talk about a couple of those today. Um, the first is the change in which, um, in the ways in which we register to vote in this country. Um, the traditional model um, was, um, you know, you can close your eyes, think of the mental image of a person with a clipboard. Um, you know, at a, at, a, at a bus stop, at a county fair, um, at any place where people were gathered, uh, you would see somebody with a clipboard um, offering it to folks to fill out a form uh, to register to vote. Increasingly, that is not the way Americans register to vote or change their registrations. And in fact, um, this slide shows as of February 2016, 30 states plus the District of Columbia offering online registration. That number is now 33 on the eve of Election Day, um, with something like seven more states um, preparing um, to implement uh, online voter registration after Election Day. Um, that's a huge change. 
Um, not only does it mean less work for election officials and processing paper registrations, but it also opens up um, new opportunities for voters um, to update um, and check their registrations. And in fact, um, many of you um, here uh, in Minnesota or wherever you are across the nation or around the world may have received a notification from your election official suggesting that you check your registration. Um, those of us who are of a certain age remember the days when you would check your flight reservation before you went to the airport. Um, more and more election officials are encouraging voters to do the same thing with their voter registration. Make sure your name is correct, make sure your address is correct, make sure you know where your polling place is. And a lot of that um, is because of um, the advent of online registration across the country. We're also starting to see um, the growth of um, a new approach to voter registration in the dark green states um, on this slide. Um, it goes by many different names. It's called automatic registration. It's called new motor voter. Um, it's called um, um, agency registration. But in the five states um, here, Oregon, California, West Virginia, Connecticut, uh, and Vermont, um, the state has gone beyond merely allowing voters to register online to taking data from DMV or other state agencies and putting people who are eligible but unregistered on the voter rolls and then sending them a message that allows them to opt out if they choose to do so. Um, obviously, this is a huge change. Um, it, it, unlike the person with the clipboard, it's almost like the state has the clipboard and they are looking to put people on the rolls and then give them a chance to decide whether or not they actually want to participate. Um, it's required quite a bit of coordination between election offices and different state agencies. Um, it is it is under review in many more states. Um, it is not um, as uniformly popular or supported across the aisle as is online registration, but it's definitely something worth watching um, in the wake of the 2016 election. Another big change we're seeing is that states are now working more closely together than ever to manage their voter rolls. Uh, over the years, states have often compared their lists with neighboring states um, to identify folks who may have moved between jurisdictions. But increasingly, we're seeing these multi-state efforts um, like one called ERIC, the Electronic Registration Information Center, um, initially started by the Pew Trusts and now run by the member states. And those states uh, share voter lists which are then compared against a variety of other different um, data sources, social security death records, change of address, uh, and other um, files which are intended to help identify both individuals um, who are no longer eligible at an address um, where they're currently registered or individuals who are eligible to vote but for some reason have not registered. Um, many of you um, who have moved in the past and Americans move on average um, one out of every eight Americans moves uh, every year. You may have noticed that that some mail takes its time to find you at your new address. Um, your credit card bill rarely does. Um, and that's because the companies um, do a very good job of tracking um, address changes. Um, that's the kind of data that's also being included in this uh, ERIC project, which allows them to then identify when a Doug Chapin has moved from Minnesota to Virginia to Connecticut and so forth. Um, the other thing that states are not only encouraged but obliged to do is to take that list of individuals who are eligible to vote um, but are not registered to vote and requires them to reach out either by email or a postcard but to say to them um, we've identified you as someone who might be interested in registering to vote here's an opportunity to do so. Um, a couple states like Oregon are taking that further and actually putting those folks on the rolls with the chance to opt out um, but if nothing else, this level of coordination um, is something that we are seeing uh, increasingly across the country and which I think voters will begin to notice um, at the polls as soon as this fall. So let's talk a little bit about um, what Election Day looks like. Larry already talked about when is Election Day. Um, and this picture um, is um, by uh, Norman Rockwell from 1944. Um, I actually refer to the traditional method of voting in this country as relying on Norman Rockwell polling places. And in your mind's eye, it looks a lot 
like this. You've got an American flag, you've got some sort of community building, you've got poll workers behind a desk uh, and a list, uh, and then um, an opportunity for voters to cast a ballot on a machine or some other um, method. I think the only thing that's missing in this picture is the gentleman in the glasses to the far right holding an I voted sticker. But otherwise, um, this really accurately describes what most polling places look like across the country. Um, that really isn't the way it is in most jurisdictions anymore. We have seen an explosion in alternatives to the polling place, vote by mail, um, early voting, vote centers, um, the delightfully oxymoronic in-person absentee voting that you have um, in many states. And as a result, we now go from the one size fits all of the Norman Rockwell polling place to this huge array of different methods that voters can use to cast their ballots through the mail in a drop box or at some sort of center on election day. Um, Larry mentioned the 40% number. Um, my still anecdotal um, sense this year is that a lot of the um, attention and tension um, driven by the presidential race is leading voters to want to cast their ballots earlier than ever, either because they want to register their choice or because they want to stop getting the direct mail and phone calls. Um, but it's become what I call a belt and suspenders elections, that people are checking and rechecking their um, their, their voter registrations. And because of that, we're seeing huge interest in pre-election day voting across the country. And in fact, I saw um, a report um, the other day that suggested that the pre-election vote in North Carolina in five days of early voting has already exceeded the total number of ballots cast early in North Carolina in 2012. And this is only five days into the early voting period this time. So it'll be interesting to see if the nation actually gets to um, close to 50 percent ballots cast before Election Day. I think there's a very good chance um, that we do that. Um, these new methods also mean new challenges for election officials. Um, in the old days in the Norman Rockwell polling place, you pretty much just had to make sure that you knew how many people were going to vote on Election Day and staff and stock your polling places accordingly. Uh, under these new models, election officials also have to figure out where and when voters will cast their ballots um, and how they'll do so, whether it's through the mail or in person or what have you. And if you get that calculation wrong, it can result in problems. Um, those of you who followed the presidential campaign may remember that there were very, very long lines um, in the Phoenix area um, during the Arizona primary, partly because election officials there, um, I think, figured that many more voters were going to cast their votes um, through the mail than actually did. Many of them showed up at a reduced number of polling places on election day, um, causing problems for that election official that um, reverberate right until today. So um, this new era of choice for voters means a lot of hard choices for election officials in Minnesota and elsewhere. Um, very quickly, um, those of you who do vote um, either at an early voting location or um, a polling place on election day, um, you may want to take a good look at the machines that are being used there. There's a very good chance um, that they won't be there for years from now. Um, we are reaching the end of the useful life of many of the voting machines across the country. Um, and the President's uh, Commission on Election Administration um, talked about an impending crisis in voting technology um, at the state and local level as election officials seek to replace the machines they already have. Most of those jurisdictions that are thinking about buying new machines have two choices. The first is to find new money for it. Um, that usually means going to the legislature and asking them to dip into some kind of general fund or some sort of dedicated fund for new machines. Um, and um, anyone who's dealt with legislatures and knows how many different funding and policy priorities uh, they have knows that that can be a huge challenge. And you'll actually often get the same kind of reaction that you're seeing in this picture uh, with the, the legislature telling you um, that the pocket and or the cupboard is bare. Um, the other option, which is also not easy, is to rethink the voting process and purchase machines accordingly. Um, it is no longer enough to just buy new machines to stock your Norman Rockwell polling places. If you live in a state 
um, like Minnesota, for example, where more and more voters are casting their ballots before election day. You have to think not just about what machines will be in the polls on election day, but how many polls there will be and whether or not you need all the machines that you have. The good news is, is that tends to be less expensive than um, just buying new machines for traditional polling places. Um, the bad news is, is that that means a huge change in the way um, elections work, which tends to make elected officials, who you'll remember were elected under the system you're proposing to change, very nervous. And so very often the choice for an election official or someone seeking to improve voting technology the choice that they face is either asking for more money or asking elected officials to change. And for many of them, that can feel like a choice between the frying pan and the fire. Uh, and then finally, as we approach, you know, we're now 13 days to election day. Um, you'll notice in the news around the country, um, we'll probably see the lawyers get involved as they inevitably do, uh, whether it's fights about mail voting, whether it's about um, photo ID, about times and locations for um, early voting, or even um, disputes on election day about um, keeping polling places open late because of problems at uh, the beginning of the day. Um, it's usually a good thing that the courts get involved because courts can do something that um, legislatures don't often do, which is act quickly and decisively. Um, the problem is, is that these disputes often end up running up against um, election day. Um, Really quickly, some big issues here. Um, there are some fights in the country um, about whether the federal government or the state government should have the upper hand in um, election policy, um, and that involves constitutional language, the Voting Rights Act, um, and the new Federal Election Assistance Commission. Um, but the big thing to watch between now and Election Day is whether or not um, pending litigation ends up changing the rules at the last minute or creating uncertainty before election day. Um, these are the rules that you can probably remember, that lawsuits are inevitable, lawsuits will likely be everywhere, and they will create uncertainty in the run-up to election day. Um, as I mentioned, there are 13 days until election day. If you haven't voted already, um, I do encourage you to um, check um, uh, your polling place, check your registration, um, and if you have any questions, um, make sure to reach out to your local election officials. Um, they have obviously been under fire this election season, uh, but have um, really gone the extra mile in making themselves and their offices um, wide open to questions from voters. So as election day gets closer, let's be careful out there. And I will take questions. Doug, let, let me, uh, this is Larry Jacobs, let, let me ask you the first question, if I could. Uh, there's a lot of talk about rigging of elections. Um, first off, could you give us a sense of what rigging means to you um, and how you think about the idea of voter fraud at such a massive level that it would change the outcome of a presidential election? Um, and uh, what kind of effects that we might see from um, uh, decisions that have been made by legislatures such as voter ID, um, and other sorts of processes um, that were deliberate and, you know, went through a legitimate process mm -hmm. of being voted on a legislature and signed by a governor. Sure. So I, I, I think, you know, the, the, to me, the quick definition of rigging, um, if you think of Election Day as a flow where voters um, fill out ballots, put them into the system, those ballots are counted, a result is reached, and winners are declared. To me, rigging is some sort of outside interference that gets between cast ballots and reporting of the result in such a way that if A should have won, B is declared the winner. So it's some sort of outside interference. Um, I differentiate that. That would be, you have to deliberately do that. It has to be a bad act. It has to be um, what I would call malfeasance um, rather than misfeasance, which is errors or mistakes uh, on election day. Um, I think a lot of the, the talk lately about fraud um, has to do with concerns which exist between the parties across the country about um, how to balance the desire to let every eligible voter participate and the desire to keep the integrity of the system whole. Um, Democrats tend to worry about eligible voters not being allowed to cast ballots. Republicans tend to worry more about ineligible voters being allowed to cast 
ballots. Uh, and so in many legislatures across the country, you have had fights about photo ID or proof of citizenship or other rules that are intended to create barriers or what the proponents would say safeguards um, that make sure that people who are casting ballots are actually eligible to cast those ballots. Um, the debate you're seeing right now across the country is that one candidate seems to think that those safeguards or barriers, whatever you want to call them, are not enough and that ineligible voters are going to affect the result. Um, and another candidate arguing that the the rigging that's going on is actually um, erecting these barriers and keeping otherwise eligible voters from the polls. Um, courts are still involved with um, working out the results um, of some of those laws, but that'll be something we'll be watching in the 13 days between now and election day. So just to follow up on that, if the current polls are to be believed, and it's not one or two polls, this is dozens of different polling organizations, and if you look at real clear politics, for instance, you see Hillary Clinton is about a five percentage point lead. Um, when you look at, which I would say is a substantial lead, um, if the election turns out to have a popular vote difference of four points or more, is there um, a way in which um, malfeasance could be conducted at a level and a scope that would change the outcome, that would wipe out uh, that advantage, or if Donald Trump were up by four points and the polls were wrong, I mean, is that you know kind of magnitude of of wrongdoing and corruption possible in America? No, um, in a word, no. Um, my favorite metaphor for the American electoral system is of a stained glass window. Um, you know, people often ask from around the world, why don't we have a uniform election system? You know, in this country, we do have a uniform election system. It's that everybody does things differently and can't believe anybody else um, um, doesn't do it like they do. Um, but in that environment, the notion that you could swing a result, even in a big county or at a state level, um, is, is tremendously difficult. There's simply too many safeguards. And so the notion that it could be done at the national level by either somebody inside the country or somebody um, from you know, another country that shall name, remain nameless but rhymes with Russia, um, <laughs> I think um, is um, so improbable as to be essentially impossible. Well, this is a great conversation and uh, we still have a few more minutes before we wrap up at One Central. Um, so if you have questions, definitely type them into the questions pane of Go uh, to Webinar. Uh, there's a couple questions that came in right off the bat that I think we can combo together is that um, perhaps with the outcome of the election, we will still be looking at some type of divided government, whether it's a, a Democratic president and a GOP controlled uh, legislature. Um, so, you know, considering perhaps the restraints um, an incoming president might um, face with a, with split government or just uh, as one person observed the lack of cooperation between political parties. Um, what do you think, uh, and I'll maybe uh, direct this to Larry, what do you think will be um, po actually possible for the new president uh, to accomplish and, and how? Well, the short answer is not much. Um, and I'm, I'm basically an upbeat, optimistic person, but I'm also someone who studies this a lot. And they're just lock in on um, deep partisan differences. Very important to notice in this election season, in both parties, the candidates who were the more moderate candidates tended to face primary challenges. The candidates who are winning and um, or the nominees and then they're winning in the general election tend to be those who are the true believers, who don't compromise on what are considered to be party principles. Um, and so when you think of the dynamics of this election season, whether it was Bernie Sanders uh, providing a surprisingly uh, tough and long challenge to Hillary Clinton or the rise of Donald Trump, you've got Democrats now are going to be looking over their shoulder at the possibility that Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren's supporters will be putting up a primary challenge against them if they don't <coughs> excuse me, um, hold to a pretty uh, progressive or left uh, position. On the Republican side, You've got several factors, one of which is uh, folks are worried about Tea Party, about Trump supporters. Uh, they're also um, 
uh, quite aware that in the House of Representatives, there's a group, small group, but influential group in the Freedom Caucus. Um, and they're going to be insisting uh, that uh, any policy passed by Congress lower spending uh, and cut taxes. And, you know, if you've got to compromise with, you know, according to polls today with uh, uh, President Clinton, it's going to be very difficult. So I'm not expecting, uh, you know, significant legislation. I think, sadly, probably what we're going to see is more uh, presidents going alone, as we saw with George W. Bush, as we saw with Barack Obama. And I think that would be the case with Hillary Clinton administration, that we're going to see a lot more of the presidents exercising whatever authority that they can put their hands on uh, to try to move immigration reform, to, to do what they can to... Um, to try to address the challenges in the Affordable Care Act, uh, to conduct foreign policy and national security efforts abroad. Um, you know, there was a, a longstanding argument in Washington that uh, the problem was Barack Obama's personality was a bit standoffish, that the Clintons are really great at bringing people together. Hillary Clinton is a, is a terrific compromiser. And, you know, there may be uh, some things possible now that weren't, but this is not going to wipe out what is an historic level of polarization. Um, the two parties disagree now at a, uh, to the degree that we last saw around the Civil War. Around the Civil War. So, no, we're, we're for tough sledding, and it worries me quite a bit. Some of the other hats I wear, you know, I'm deeply concerned about um, domestic and foreign policies, and I don't see the country uh, really developing a um, an effective and responsible governing coalition. Thank you, Larry. Um, this question is for, for Doug. Uh, do you see differences in electoral administration and competency in election administration in Democratic-controlled states versus Republican Party-controlled states? Um, yeah. And it's a kind of a two-part question. I, I don't see any difference in competence. Um, I, 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 um, one of the nice things about my work is that I can say with great, great confidence that um, the competence of election administrators across the country um, is solid across the board. There is difference in um, um, in election administration. Again, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of talk between the parties about accusing one another of, of voter fraud or voter suppression. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that the parties view election administration differently, just like they view lots of other things differently. You know, if, if, if I were to tell you that the next person to come on the line here at the webinar um, opposes voter ID and likes automatic voter registration, um, it would be a pretty good guess that she was a Democrat. And if that same, if I told you that after that, that somebody came on um, who wanted um, to impose um, documentary proof of citizenship on new voters and had great concerns about automatic voter registration, you would assume that he is a Republican. And so um, one of the things we're starting to see is that Secretary of State or legis or uh, um, Lieutenant Governor races, which are the chief state election officials in some states, are actually becoming just as partisan um, as other statewide races, in part because the two parties realize that whoever's in control of the Secretary of State's office has at least the loudest voice, if not the only voice, on election administration policy. So, you know, you can have um, an official um, like um, John Husted in Ohio, um, who has been um, skeptical about some of the reforms that um, the Democrats have proposed, but then actually very enthusiastic about others. Um, he would govern very differently than a Democratic Secretary of State would. Um, you've seen that here in, Min in Minnesota. I mean, I think that, uh, that the, the difference from former Secretary Kiffmeyer to former Secretary Ritchie and now current Secretary Simon um, suggests the wide gulf that Larry mentions between the parties exists on election administration as well. The good news is, though, is that the people at the ground level, the county and local election officials who do their jobs, aren't political in the first place um, and tend to do an excellent job regardless of whatever letter is after their boss's name at the state level. Larry, are there any um, 
U.S. Senate races that the audience should really pay attention to these next couple weeks as far as that could, you know, sway things, just from your perspective, that could sway things? Well, I think the Democrats are going to need uh, to win um, New Hampshire and Pennsylvania. Um, and right now those are toss-ups or the Republican has uh, a bit of an advantage. Um, North Carolina is a pretty close race that probably will require uh, the Democrats winning. Um, Florida, uh, where the Democrats initially had hope, Marco Rubio has jumped into the back into the race after saying he would not run. And um, I think he's probably in control of that race. Uh, one of the surprises is that uh, Rob Portman, Republican in Ohio, is off to a double digit lead and almost certainly will win there. Um, one of the biggest surprises, if you really want to dig in on a race, is in Missouri. Um, um, uh, and um, the, the issue in um, Missouri is that you've got a Secretary of State, young, very creative, um, who's running against one of the most solid uh, and heavily favored incumbents, uh, Roy Blunt. Um, and the Democrat, Kander, ran an ad um, in which he assembles a gun with blindfolds on um, and makes the case that he is supportive of Second Amendment rights. He's served on the military extensively, but he has questions about the ease of access to um, to guns. And this has kind of electrified uh, his campaign, and he's pulled within five or six points. Probably at the end of the day, it's going to be hard for him to win. Um, I think bottom line is for Democrats uh, to get the majority, and they're, they need to pick up a net four seats to have a tie uh, so that uh, if there was a Clinton administration, the vice president, could break the tie. Um, and, you know, if you look at the polls, I think it's still pretty close to a toss up as to whether that's going to happen. And I'd, I'd feel um, pretty cautious about making a, a strong prediction on that. And, and, and I, I, I'm not I'm not a political guy, but as somebody who deals with special elections all the time, uh, I will point out that if there is um, a Clinton victory, that will then open up a Senate seat in the state of Virginia. And so if the Senate is tied um, at the time, um, there will likely be um, a pitched battle for that 50th seat. Um, and I, I, I don't envy my friends in the election business um, in Virginia to go from a highly fought um, uh, presidential election to what is likely to be a highly fought Senate election at the same time as a highly fought governor's race. I've, a lot of them feel like all roads lead to Virginia. So let me just follow up on that because uh, that raises an important question. Um, does the governor have the power to appoint a temporary uh, uh, sit-in senator or uh, is it remain vacant until a quick election? I don't know the answer to that question. All I know is that, that there would be a special incentive. Because this is going to be very important uh, if you've got a, a tie in the Senate. Uh, obviously Hillary Clinton's going to want to push through legislation. The other thing just to notice, by the way, uh, we're going to see this right away. Uh, after the election, there will be a push to uh, settle the um, Supreme Court nomination by Barack Obama of um, Garland. Uh, the Republicans have refused to do it. Um, we may actually see some slackening of that as Republicans figure that Garland, who's by all accounts uh, quite moderate and in the past Republicans have supported him, will think he's a better choice than um, the probably more liberal candidate that Hillary Clinton would put up. So we may see an effort to move on that, um, and that'll certainly be one of the big, big uh, initial signs about, frankly, how dysfunctional um, Washington's going to be over the next four years. Larry and Doug, are there, um, and just in closing, are there any um, uh, preferred uh, Twitter channels or social media um, channels that you want to tell the folks about so they can follow you between now and election and beyond? Well, I think one of the best uh, places to go is to the Humphrey School. Um, hashtag HHH today. Uh, you get the best news there. Also, I wanted to mention, uh, this was uh, indicated briefly at the, at the outset, Doug Chapin is directing uh, this first-of-a-kind program in the country, uh, which is uh, training for election officials. The Board of Regents at the University of Minnesota recently approved a certificate 
There are online courses, so we're attracting people from all over the, the country. And the idea is that election officials are these kind of heroes of democracy in the trenches. But up to this point, they really have not had access to high quality training. That's what Doug is providing. He's really mobilized the very best and the brightest from around the country to be uh, building these courses. Uh, he's been working with Dell Tech, which is one of the leading uh, most innovative co uh, companies in the country in online curriculum, very innovative. This is way past just uh, kind of uh, staring into a screen and lecturing. There's gaming in it. There's all sorts of um, interactive components. Um, and uh, you know, I think it's something the Humphrey School is very excited about. If you're interested in that, uh, you can go to the Humphrey School and look up the Certificate in Election Administration. It's a terrific opportunity in a field where there's a big generational turnover as folks are, are retiring. Um, there, there are a lot of spots to be filled. Yeah, uh, this is Doug. Election administration needs you. If you're thinking about an exciting new career, if you're interested in it, election officials need it. Uh, and if you want a taste of the kind of stuff we talk about um, in the program, you can follow me on Twitter at HHH Elections, um, which has um, interactions with some of uh, the other leading um, uh, thinkers in election administration and also includes posts from our daily blog, which takes a look at um, current events in the field. Um, from the election administrator's point of view. So we hope you'll you'll uh, you'll check us out and follow us. Well, Larry and Doug, thank you so much for for joining us today, and thank you to everyone who tuned in and 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 who's uh, listening to this recording after the fact as well. And um, just in closing, again, members of the alumni association have helped make initiatives like this webinar series possible. So thank you. Uh, you help make our global community of alumni stronger than ever. And um, if you're interested in becoming a member, it's umnalumni.org slash membership. Uh, that's the conclusion of today's webinar. Uh, remember, everyone, go out and vote. And uh, this is John Ruzek signing off for the Alumni Association. Have a wonderful day.